Good evening. In this week's live edition, the Hull University students who have an album out just as they're taking their finals, the best-selling Everything But The Girl. The film that's cleaning up in the States by cleaning up street styles, breakdance, a book that quotes everything from Nietzsche to the Wreath Lectures in tackling the enigmatic appeal of Joy Division and New Order, and the small independent record label which is plundering the vaults of the major label Atlantic and discovering a wealth of forgotten classics. And to talk about all that, the wonderfully varied panel of George Michael from Wham, who have this week's highest entry in the singles charts with Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go, Morrissey from The Smiths, who this week released their new single, Heaven Knows I'm Miserable Now, and Tony Blackburn, the veteran DJ who's been treated as a brand new star here in the South East, thanks to his policy of mixing outrageous phone calls and excellent soul music on Radio London. And we start with everything but the girl, the gentle duo of Tracy Thorne and Ben Watt, currently in the top 40 with each and every one. Apart from their own work, together or as soloists, they've had a considerable effect on Paul Weller's music. He's played with them and they've played with the Style Council. This week, Tracy has been taking her finals in Hull in drama and Ben's been taking his English exams. And hot on the heels of their single, they've now released their first album, Eden. Tony, you've actually been playing the single along with all the black music on your mm. show. Do you like the whole album? I'm still getting over the veteran DJ, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I did start when I was 10. Um, yes, I, did, I liked it to a certain extent. I, I mean, the single, the reason why I'm playing it as a soul record is it's very, very soulful. Uh, the album's got this bottom over beat uh, going through it the whole way. I find it a bit monotonous, to be honest with you. And it strikes me, although she's got a very nice voice, I can take it probably for one, um, one single. And there are one or two other tracks on it that were very nice. But I think it would be, probably become a little bit background for me. Uh, there isn't enough light and shade in the album. Uh, but apart from that, I, I rather like it. It's, it's a nice sound, and uh, I mean, there's room for it, but I don't know, not, not quite for me. But I love the single. The single's great. George? Um, I must admit, there's not that much to add to that. I think that the single is the best thing on the album, definitely. Uh, I love her voice as, I mean, it's very, it's great to get you, I mean, it's so melancholy, and it's just so vulnerable that it's a, it's a beautiful voice in that way, but... Um, for a whole album, it does drag on a bit, you know, and it actually starts to take away from the songs, because individually, you can appreciate them a lot better, and they are very good songs, or four or five on the album anyway. But as an album, it starts to, you know, to wash a bit. Yeah. But she's become something of a cult figure, though, hasn't she? Yeah, with the Marine Girls and with the Style Counts and all that. But yeah. Uh, she's becoming a little bit more accessible, I think, probably, I don't know, it just seems to be a coincidence they've just signed to uh, WEA, but um, it does seem a lot more accessible than before. I think... It's nowhere near as good as Plain Sailing, which is my favourite track of hers, but uh, still a good album. Morrissey, I know you know them. Do you uh, approve of their album? Um, to a large degree, I do, because at least half of the album I really like, and I feel that if I can like at least half an album, f well, for me personally, that, that's really quite uh, revolutionary. Which I, bits do you like and why? Well, I did think that Another Bridge is really quite spectacular. I'm still mystified about the single, and the success of the single, which uh, I think you it's... You don't think it's that good? No, I don't. Why not? I think it's perhaps the most least attractive track. I don't know, I can't explain it. It just didn't really strike me that much. So, but obviously I really like them. I think melodically it's the, I think it's the most, um, I don't know, I think it's most interesting melodically on there. I thought it was wonderful, the, the single. I don't like albums, though. I mean, I get, Ever? I, no, no, I, d I generally don't like albums very much. I want to go on from uh, one particular sound to another. And I find on an album, it's very lucky if you can find three or four good tracks anyway. But I don't actually like listening to albums very much. What about this, this as a sound, though? It's been described as part of a new soft rock, it's jazz rock. It's a over, isn't it? Uh, it's it's very, very old-fashioned in a way, isn't it? Yeah. I, mean, I, yeah. I, used to play this, I used to play this about uh, 25 years ago in uh, the Bournemouth Pavilion. Orchestra. I was in an orchestra then. We were sort of bashing out the bottom. Playing to what sort of audience? <laughs> uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, some mayors, I mean, civic dads, receptions, people, or? civic receptions at the time. Yeah, yeah, things like that. But uh, yeah, people were bossing over and around. But um, it's not a, It's a. It's an old town come back again, really. Morris, do you think it's old fashioned as such? Well, it is. But I mean, nearly most music is. I can't think in those terms. I just think is it is it good or is it bad? I don't really mind if it's if it could be described as old fashioned. Because if it's appealing, I, I'll accept that, you know, whether it's just, you know, caveman beating on a drum or whatever. I like it, ultimately. It seems to be very anti-fashion music. I mean, they don't care about their image too much. Yeah, but that almost becomes an image, and it al almost becomes the ac a absolute heart of fashion. So, um, and I think it will. I think that's what makes them so fashionable in, in, in press at the moment, is the fact that uh, they're very anti-image, and... Um, 
in a way, there is, they do care about their image and their fashion because the, the music shows that. It is all of a certain type and it just has that, has that jazz influence. But um, it, is, it justifies it, I think, because the atmosphere is so good. Thank you. And everything but the girls' Eden will be available next week. Also on release next week, there's a music film that earned a remarkable $25 million in its first week in America. It's called Breakdance. It tells the story of a white dancer who joins a black breakdancing team who perform in Venice Beach, Los Angeles, and appear to me to live in a ghetto furnished by habitat. The breakdancers take on the straight musical dancing establishment, and of course they become stars in the end. Here's a clip in which the white dancer, played by Lucinda Dickey, gets her first break. Boy, do I have an eye... George Wham have obviously been influenced by such black musical styles. Is a film you'd recommend? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to review this without being incredibly unkind to everybody involved. Actually, my my being machine, incredibly unkind in that case. Being incredibly unkind. Well, actually, my video machine chewed the tape up after about 15 minutes, so I've only got 15 minutes to go on here, right? But um, I mean, basically, I think like um, it's quite a long time since Buffalo Girls came out, and I think soon after Buffalo Girls, all the amazing things you were ever going to see about break dancing had been seen. And since then, like, people have had their necks broken, like, twisting on their heads and everything. I think it's all become very boring. But the thing is, because America's such a big place, uh, it's American finance has suddenly caught up with break dancing, and there's the money to put into films like this. We, uh, it's just atrocious, really. What I saw of it was atrocious, but I only saw 15 minutes. So I think that's, that's, a, that's about enough from me. It's got a happy ending. Has it got a happy yeah. ending? Yeah. Well, <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> also, I think it's very, very much like the token, you know, white girl uh, in, in the, the... I mean, it's, it's like, let's get all markets, let's get a white girl learning how to break dance and everything. It's it struck me the sort of film we could have made in the last 20 years about anything at all except it happened to be about break dancing. Probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I do. Morrissey. I found it really repellent. I, I found every aspect of the film repellent. I, I couldn't really understand uh, Lucinda D Dickey. Dickey, yeah, She really confused me. She couldn't act and she spoke so lowly throughout the whole thing. Could she dance? Well, no. I mean, uh, no, she couldn't. Um, I mean, the script was virtually invisible, and all the characters were so wooden. To me, it, it would have been okay, perhaps, a, 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 some kind of a documentary. As a feature film, it, it's hopeless. And yet, Americans are flocking to see it, and there are millions, it would seem, in $25 oh. million well, takings in a week. Same it's with, extraordinary. Same with Footloose, and I re yeah. literally have never seen a film as bad as Footloose. I went to America a couple of weeks ago, and we went to see it thinking we'd go to this packed cinema full of screaming kids and this film that was like Grease or something like that. And it was just so atrocious, I couldn't believe it. It was just terrible. But, um, I mean, it doesn't seem to mean anything anymore. Box office records don't mean anything. Tony? Well, I liked it. You see, you I did? Was, yeah, I, mean, I thought for what it was. Great, well done. I thought it was great. And I thought she had a most can I she had a most gorgeous bum as well, I mean, which I I mean I don't know you're if you're not allowed to say that, but I said it. Now. Well, I mean I thought she did. I mean absolutely gorgeous, and even for that I'd go along and see it. And uh, I thought she was quite a good dancer, but I thought break dancing as well. I just love it. I think it's very clever. And there's a sequence which wasn't shown there where, where a kid he must have been about ten years old spinning round on his head, and I know it's dangerous. But, I mean, it was absolutely incredible. I thought the dancing was great. So, did you really sit through the whole two yeah. hours of it? Yeah. yeah, and I tell you what, the copy I had, the sound wasn't very good, and I still sat through it. I mean, OK, the acting's not very good, but when the dancing comes, and it's electric, I think. And I think it's very clever. Didn't you find the script absolutely awful? Though? Who Did cares? You find... I mean, we're well, trying to... good rap films like was yeah. it Wild Style last year. It wasn't too bad. Yeah, we're trying to read something into this that isn't there. I, th I think Soul fans will enjoy it because... Uh, the Rufus and Chaka Khan sequence, it was okay, but the music is quite fun. It's not even very uh, well filmed, Tony. The, the breakdance no, isn't very well filmed. No, I mean, it could have been better, but I think for what it is, it's just a bit of, um, bit of fun, and I, th I think pe people will probably enjoy it. It's not one of the best films, no, of course not. But I thought the dancing is so electric, and it's something a bit different. How long so... this whole flow of dance film goes on? I mean, it's such a lot of them now, and they seem to be all much of a piece. Yeah, I just enjoy dancing, really. I, I, this film, you're, you're quite right, it wasn't filmed very well. But I think it will, will appeal to people. <clears throat> I think, I mean, you I know, it. I understand what you're, you're talking about, but I think if you really wanted to see that entertainment and hear the music, because there's some mm. good music on the soundtrack, you might as well go to a good, a good club. What, what, about, what about the music? Yeah. About the same price. What about the music then? I mean, there's some Al Jarreau, there's a there's bit of Shaka Khan we saw yeah, there. Yeah, there's a, f a couple of tracks which I couldn't understand getting anywhere near a film as bad as that. But really. there's some fairly mediocre stuff as well, surely. Oh, yeah, but, I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there's, media, there's an awful lot of mediocre breakdancing music. You know? That was just beat, though, wasn't it? I mean, they just had the beat going so that they could dance to it. But I, I, just thought the, I just thought the way they danced was incredibly good. And it will probably start off a whole new trend. I mean, I know there is a lot of... But it'll, it'll make it even bigger, I think. 
Thank you. Yeah. And breakdowns can be seen in London, the South, West and the Midlands from next week and in the rest of the country in July. Now the history of Joy Division and New Order, a band who changed their name when Ian Curtis committed suicide four years ago this month. Despite the hits like Blue Monday and Thieves Like Us, the band have retained a cult image and a sense of distance from the rest of the music scene. This week, they're the subject of a new book, An Ideal for Living, which to the uninitiated may seem as impenetrable as their record covers. It's written by Mark Johnson and three others and follows the band's careers from their beginnings in Manchester with an almost day-by-day -day compilation of press clippings. These are interrupted by curious selections from French writer Albert Camus, a 1944 treatise on film, or the 1982 Wreath Lectures. From Ian Curtis's days with Joy Division, here's Transmission. Morrissey, before we look at the book, uh, perhaps you could try and explain the extraordinary appeal of Joy Division and now New Order, speaking as a fellow Mancunian. Mm. I don't know whether I could explain it. Um, well, they're treated quite unlike any other band in Britain, yes, really, aren't they? Yes, they are. I think, um, I think most people, I, I think most people's vision of Joy Division is entirely coloured by the death of Ian Curtis. And it's always really the, the really only factor that, that um, people seem to discuss. Um, Joy Division were one group that, that I, I really didn't take to that much. Did you used to go and see them in Manchester? I saw them a few times by accident. And, <laughs> but I, I, I can now completely appreciate their appeal. But I look upon Ian Curtis and, and certainly New Order uh, as neither singers or, or lyricists, but uh, as symbolists. I think they were quite accurate uh, and they, um, they, they had the spirit of, of the times. And, but I think it was totally false. It was like people saying, well, yes, this is how life is totally without emotion, which of course they weren't, and we are totally hard people, which of course they weren't. It was like this complete affectation uh, of people wanting to be something that they weren't. I find it quite sad, but in a musical sense I hear nothing whatsoever. But um, What about the book then, and does that the sum book, up what people you saw in stage in Manchester? Um, the book confused me. When it was straightforward, written in a, almost a, a, a diary fashion, I, I found it quite interesting. What about all those quotes from yeah, the lectures got, um, and all that sort of strange stuff? Or ostentatious, it was very, very boring. But um, ultimately, I, I would support, uh, at the end of the day, I would support New Order and uh, Joy Division. But um, with some confusion, I'll admit. Tony, uh, not a band I suspect you'd approve of. No, well, well, I mean, um, as long as people get pleasure out of uh, them, that's fine, but it's n certainly not me, no. And the book, um, I should probably think, for the fans of Joy Division, uh, it would probably appeal to them, but... Uh, what did I you make of it, though? Well, I, I found it incredibly boring. Um, there were certain bits of it that I found a bit disturbing <laughs> as well. I mean, the, they were always trying to get over this fascist image and things like that. And, uh, I mean, one or two bits and pieces. The, the I always denied they were fascists, but they did seem to give yes, themselves right. fascist names. The bit where it let, let down, I mean, the Ian Curtis committed suicide, and the book didn't actually go into that. Now, anybody who is interested in that, I suppose that would be the thing that would be interesting. There's some extraordinary quote there that it's it said, that speculation yeah. is not only futile, but an invasion of his privacy, mm. which... Um, as a journalist, I mean, that would seem to be the key yeah. essence of the book is why the guy died, and you, mm. you, you skirt around think, it like that. I also think the book assumes that you know everything there is to know about Joy Division. Now, somebody, obviously, it's not really fair for me to judge it, because I'm not the slightest bit interested, and it's not my Have you heard music. their music ever? Oh, I've heard it, yes. It's, what do you think of it? Well, it's not for me. No, but I, I'm very, you know, I'm more into soul, the soul sort of side of it. But um, the thing is that they assume that you know everything about the group. I would personally have liked them to go into detail about the individual members of the group. And they didn't do that. They went from one gig to another. And quite honestly, I'm not interested in the fact they appeared in the Cat's Whiskers Club in wherever it was, and they left the gear on the stage for a roadie to clear up. I mean, it's not interesting. I mean, right. That's what every group does. And there was one particular section where they said that uh, because of Joy Division, or whatever they called themselves in those days, they proved that anybody could get together, even without being able to sing, being able to uh, actually play an instrument. They claim in Smash Hits this week they still can't play as New Order, which I thought was... Slightly curious. Well, George, yeah. George um, I wouldn't imagine you as a Joy Division fan. Maybe I'm wrong. You might be wrong. I might be wrong. <laughs> this, this, the book just became incredibly suspect for me the minute I saw... Um, you do like them, I mean, that's... I do like them, yeah. It became very suspect when I saw that it was partially, uh, well, a lot of the contributions were, were from a gentleman called Paul Morley. And you don't you'd, approve of Mr. You'd need, you'd need a book a lot thicker than that just to li list that man's... Um, that man's uh, ideas or hang-ups, whatever you like to call it, but it became very, very pretentious in so many areas that I, I just, I actually didn't finish it, I didn't get anywhere near finishing it. Um, and I actually really liked Joy Division, or particularly their second album, what, 
Closer. Closer. I thought Closer, the second side of Closer, is uh, one of my favourite albums. It's just beautiful. I mean, yeah. like, musically... 24 hours, sounds like... Um, I can't remember. There was, there was The Eternal and... Uh, uh, yeah, 24 hours. There's, there's, there's just four tracks, which I don't even know the listing of, but they're, they're just beautiful musically. I didn't actually see it. I thought their image, all the, all the way through liking them, I thought their image was pretentious and contrived, and it did have very fascist elements to it. But um, I thought the music was great. I thought it was quite good the way they didn't, they didn't harp on about um, the death, because that was like, I thought that was almost like them. It could almost have been important, engineered. It was like awful. It was the way, the way that they were elevated after Ian Kirsty's death was really sick. But it was... Um, to make it a commercial book, though, that's what people yeah, want to I mean, make no, that, To George, be honest it? with you, I think that is yeah. a book for, for mm. people who are, enjoy the idea yeah. of factory. The pictures weren't uh, very good either, Sorry, but to uh, stop you there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, An Ideal for Living, A History of Joy Division, is published by Proteus. And finally tonight, the remarkable story of how independent record labels have marketed the back catalogue of a giant record label, and all quite legally. It's one of the depressing aspects of the music business that record companies often just think about the present and about profits. So once an album's been released, it's easily forgotten and can become unavailable. That's even been true of the back catalogue of Atlantic Records, perhaps the most famous soul and rhythm and blues label in America in the 50s and 60s. But now, two British independent labels, Charlie and Edsel, have managed to get hold of the great Atlantic catalogue, so this year it's going to be possible to buy once again 20 Atlantic classics by everyone from Ray Charles to Sam and Dave and Solomon Burke. This week, four of those albums are released by Ed Soul. There's Five Cool Cats from the 50s doo-wop and close harmony R&B vocalist The Clovers, Bit Bam by Clyde McFatter and The Drifters, recorded before the singer who influenced Elvis Presley became a solo star, Soul Deep from blind singer, writer and guitarist Clarence Carter, recorded in the 60s and 70s, and Spoonful from white blues singer John Hammond, taken from late 60s sessions involving everyone from Robbie Robertson to Bill <coughs> Wyman and Duane Allman. This is how the Clovers and Clarence Carter looks stars. Tony, how important do you think these reissues are? Uh, well, the Clovers, I mean, that was a little bit too early even for me, because uh, it d didn't really... <laughs> Not <laughs> seen, possible, surely. You seem surprised, Robin. <laughs> um, no, that, that, that's too old-fashioned as far as I'm concerned. Clarence Carter, yeah, but that was the, I think, late 60s a little bit. But it's good that it's there for people who want that, but that doo-wop type of music is not, uh, not for me. I like the Clarence Carter, but for me, you see, I'm more interested in Eddie Floyd and Sam and Dave and the early Motown uh, <coughs> stuff, which we've got. So that really, although the real fanatics will like that, I think for even for soul fans of today, it'll probably be a little bit too uh, boring. I find it a bit boring, to be honest with you. I was motoring... Uh, which was one right do you prefer of, the, of, the, of the, those? Clarence ones? Carter. Yeah. yeah Not Clive McFatter, I thought that was wonderful. Uh, it, it was okay, but uh, Clarence Carter, to me, that's <coughs> the sort of music I started, I was playing, actually, you know, on, when I was out on the pirate ships. And uh, that, that is the sort of music I like. But I actually, you see, that's okay, but I'm not really obsessed by that, that early time anyway. I like the music and the soul music that, that they're producing now. I think that's far more exciting, and uh, it's far more listenable. Uh, but the, I like the early drifters, but this stuff was a little bit too old-fashioned, as far as I'm concerned, except the Clarence Carter. And that, that patches, that, that's an absolute classic. But I think you said they were going to release uh, Eddie Floyd and Sam and Dave. There's a whole lot more to come. This is yeah, just well, one little batch of them. Well, that's coming probably bit... not the best batch either, I think. Really? George. Yeah. I actually have a, a, a strong connection with Atlantic Records in that um, the record that I have coming out later on this year, which is a solo thing, uh, No Split, No Split, um, is, uh, is produced by Jerry Wexler. I went over to Muscle Shoals studio where a lot of the famous Atlantic Records, i.e. Aretha Franklin, Percy Sledge, Ray Charles. I mean, I actually had to sing in the same booth that they sang in, and actually to the same producer that they sang to. So if I sound nervous on my singing, you understand why. Um, but I mean, uh, that I, I actually absolutely love Aretha Franklin. I honestly was expecting to get an Aretha Franklin tape when I heard that there were some Atlantic reissues. I didn't, and I, was, um, I must actually admit that I was very disappointed with what I got, because uh, although some of the voices are fabulous, the material just isn't there as far as, as, as what I like, which is, I mean, like Say a Little Prayer is like my favourite record of all time, because it's a marvellous voice and a magnificent song together. To be honest with you, I didn't hear any songs that approached anything like Magnificent there, so I didn't find them terribly listenable at all. I mean, I loved a lot of the Atlantic record stuff, but just not what I was given here. It was lack of songs, wasn't it, actually? Lack Quite of songs, right. yeah. yeah. I mean, you need a great good. song to mm. make a great singer sound fantastic. Yeah, well, the singers were lovely, but the, just the melodies weren't there. Yeah. Morrissey. I found it really quite impossible to care. 
I, I think that there's probably several reasons why the stuff like this got lost. Why so? Because you're not interested in that era? I don't or know. Well, I'm, not, those particular records? I'm not really, but uh, I, I wasn't completely controlled by that. I did listen to the records and I found it very difficult. But I think the artwork was quite good because it wasn't, um, it wasn't foul, modern, you know, kind of um, outrageous pantomime stuff. It was very, very complimentary, I think, to the artists, which I think is quite rare. But ultimately, I don't really care. Do you listen to any old stuff at all? Apart yeah. from early Sandy Shaw, presumably. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, I'm really locked in, in, in the very early 60s, but um, I can appreciate lots of stuff from the 1950s, but... Like, like what? Mm, well, I don't know. Billy Fury? <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> but not um, the Clovers. No. It's... It doesn't matter what period anything comes from, you just still need good songs, and the Clovers did, obviously didn't have any. It still seems surprising to me that there's all this sort of been locked in the Atlantic archives, and it should take mm. a British independent company to actually pull it out. Yeah, I don't understand it why they've actually sort of. chosen to release these particular ones. I suppose there's fanatics that will, that will buy any Atlantic material, but, you know, it's just not, not of any calibre, really. So many fabulous records coming out nowadays. Who wants to buy the really old stuff? I suppose, unless, I suppose some people are quite interested in it. Well, I'm, not, I'm not obsessed by that very much. It's the <laughs> early 60s, isn't it? Thank you. And the next batch of Ed Sale Atlantic re releases from the likes of Dr. John and Benny King will be out early next month. And that's it from Eight Days this week, with many thanks to our guests, George Michael, Morrissey, who you can see again tomorrow on Pop Quiz, and Tony Blackburn. Join us again next week when my guests will be Billy Bragg, Tom Robinson and Noddy Holder. Amongst other things, we'll be talking about Status Quo's farewell tour and the new single from Frankie Goes to Hollywood. We will leave you tonight with a clip that's a bit like the missing link between two of tonight's subjects, breakdance and everything but the girl. Here with Tracy Thorne and Robert Wyatt guesting on vocals are the very classy Working Wheat with Spencer Amos. See you next Friday.